Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Welcome back to our morning city. Uh, it's our custom to go around and say our names, um, try to give it a moment between you and the, and the other person, the next person. So, my name is Cass. My name is Robert. My name is Adrian. I'm Alzac. Jason. Grisha. Tim. Don. Bob. My name is Mark. My name is Jerry. My name is Tom. I'm Larry. I'm Ed. My name is Ray. My name is Stephen. I'm Tony. I'm Joseph. Jay. And you are? Mariam. Mariam. <laughs> and here comes Jude. <laughs> so welcome AJ and Jude and Tom to the song. Please stay. We have a social hour um, after, <coughs> our, after our speaker. And, um, so please stay. Get to know us. Um, well, we're truly honored to have back a longtime friend of the Sangha, Jennifer Beresan, a uh, unique blend of musician, teacher, and activist. She's created 10 albums, combination of singer-songwriter CDs, and long-playing healing work. Recently released songs for All Beings Live, a live video of a recent performance that included over 100 artists, activists, and spiritual teachers. Um, a very impressive list of people in the uh, <laughs> video. Uh, lifelong involvement in environmental women's justice movements, earth-based spirituality is at the heart of her work. Uh, Jennifer has been a Buddhist practitioner for over 30 years, teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies in the Department of Philosophy and Religion, on Wednesday, on uh, Monday nights, I'm sorry, Monday nights over in Berkeley, um, she hosts a weekly drop-in song and meditation, which is open to everyone. Um, and uh, Jennifer's website is www.edgeofwonder.com. So welcome <laughs> back, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. It's a, always a pleasure and an honor to be here in this Sangha. Um, so I'm assuming that it's obvious that we'll be doing some <coughs> singing and chanting today. And if there's any trepidation about that, um, I thought I'd start with this Mary Oliver poem. You know, Mary Oliver passed away mm -hmm. last month. And uh, just a beloved poet to so many and to so many Dharma seekers, her work. Um, often speaks uh, to many of the things that we are exploring and care about as practitioners. And um, she's a sister lesbian and um, just really honoring Mary Oliver. And this is a poem called, I, had, I hadn't, uh, didn't know it before, it's called I Worried. <laughs> that was pretty great. And I also, there's a, some stuff in here about aging, you know, and I realized sitting here that when I first came to this song, I used to sit on the cushion. <laughs> I, I think actually I never was comfortable in the cushion. I just thought I should sit there. I felt more like the real deal. Right? So I've given it up. I've given up the um, persona of the one who sits on the cushion. <laughs> All right. I worried. <clears throat> I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, 
How shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I just imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, and gave it up, and took my old body, and went out into the morning, and sang. So, let's chant. <laughs> Very simple um, chant that comes from the Tibetan tradition. I feel so grateful to these practices that come from the East and have been so generously given to us. And I always like to really meditate on the fact that a lot of them have survived um, because of great sacrifice, really. In the West, we have so much available to us all the time. And um, I just like to remember that uh, how precious, really, these teachings and these practices are. Um, so this mantra has a couple parts. The first part is just Om Ah Kum. Let's just say that. Om Ah Kum. And that's one mantra unto itself, but then I'm going to add this second part to it that's often used, which is Vajra Guru. Vajra Guru. Heme Sidihum. Heme Sidihum. It's a very uh, common chant in the Tibetan tradition, and it's a purification chant. It'd be sort of like if we passed incense or sage around. The chant is said to function in that way to help purify the, um, our thoughts, our words, and our actions so that they can be more infused with compassion. So, Om Ahum Vajra Guru Heme Sidi Hum. We could just start all singing uh, the same note if we want, or and then just wherever you want to, to be. You know, Pete Seeger, the great Pete Seeger, says that a harmony is any note your neighbor isn't singing. <laughs>
to notice the resonance of the chant in your body, allowing it to help you arrive more deeply into relaxation, into the felt sense of sitting here, just allowing it to continue to help calm the mind, bring awareness back just into this felt sitting, feeling of sitting, resting here. I'm um, going to share some, just a few in reflections, a couple stories, and um, weave them together, of course, with all the, some chanting. <coughs> I, I love coming here partly just to hear your voices. I always say, because it's true that there are very few moments in my life I get to sit in a room with almost all men um, and sing. It's fantastic. And... Um, there's also something else for me, of course, it's very precious about coming to this sitting because um, I feel like in some ways, you know, I'm really coming to sit with my brothers. Um, and I've been thinking, and every time I come, I think, well, there's so many things I could share and talk about. But I'm also, I also feel it's really important not to skip over the fact that um, I'm, I'm here at this uh, Gay Buddhist Fellowship. And... Um, now, I've been pondering a lot this idea of identity and the Dharma, you know, because it's a paradox, really. Um, there's this, this great teaching, of course, that um, ultimately we are all part of this ground of being, that they were, we're all part of this kind of undifferentiated undiffer whole, this oneness, this luminous luminosity of being that we contact when we... Um, really get quiet and still and practice or many ways that it can happen for us. And that in those moments it's often taught that you know that form falls away and in some ways separate identity or self falls away. But at the same time of course our life experience and um, and everything that's come before conditions who we are and is a beautiful part of who we are and, and, it, and it's the compost for our awakening. So I've always felt that um, as a gay woman that that is very central to my spiritual path actually. I can't separate it. Um, and in, in a lot of ways was one of they talk about in Buddhism the, the gateways into the Dharma. You know? And um, I, I've quoted Eckhart Tolle here before in the past where he talks about when you are part of a marginalized group you already are. You already have this kind of um, place in the mind and heart that that um, questions uh, conditioned reality mm -hmm. because you're not part of it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you already have this capacity, in a way, to <coughs> deconstruct the solidity of what we're taught is real, right? So mm -hmm. it's kind of it's this. He says it's a great benefit. So I like to hold. I, 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 I like to celebrate that in all of us. Um, so I was thinking about this, and I was remembering a, a story um, of, of uh, the great uh, Zen teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. Did any of you ever sit with him when he came to the Bay Area? He's from you know, and do, how many of you know his work? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's you know one of the main people who really brought meditation practice, or what is now being called mindfulness practice in a more secular sense, but mind, but really meditation practice to the West, along with you know, Suzuki Roshi and, and Jack Kornfield and the early Westerners who went to Southeast Asia and India and brought back practices and shared them. And Thich Nhat Hanh was an uh, activist. He lived in Vietnam. He was a, he's a Buddhist monk who also was a peace activist in the sense that he refused to choose sides in the Vietnam War and instead spent his time uh, literally picking up bodies um, and burying people and doing practices for, for peace. And he was exiled and went to live in France. And he was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize by Martin Luther King. 
So I've been thinking about him a lot because he's now very close to making his transition. He's back in Vietnam and um, in the last moments of his life. No one knows how long that will last, but um, I benefited so much from going on retreat with him many, many times over the years and sitting in Plum Village where he had his, um, his place in France. And so the, there's this thing that happened once where I was on retreat with my mother. We were down in, in uh, Santa Barbara. And he was leading a retreat and I had to leave a day early and I went home and next day my, mom, my mother also got home and she called me immediately. She was so excited and she said, you won't believe what he said today. And, and I said, you know what? She said, so he was asked this question about what is God or who is God. And he said, uh, she said, he said, well, and he has this very, if you, if you ever sat with him, he had this very quiet voice, soft, and he said, maybe God is a lesbian. <laughs> God is a lesbian. And I went, no, that can't be possible. There's no way he said that. And my mom was like, no, really. And it's what he said. And this was in the early 90s. Like, this was in 1992 or something. This was way before we had breakout groups at retreats, you know. This was way before POC groups, before LGBT, the, what we call the alphabet sangha now. Um, so I, I told this story, actually, uh, at the Thanksgiving retreat at Spirit Rock because I was sitting in the um, breakout group for um, LGBTQ um, people, I. <laughs> and, um, and then I went home and I thought, I wonder, is that really true? Like, did that really happen? I've been telling this story. So I looked it up online. And a couple days ago, I found this interview on Sounds, uh, by Sounds True, the, the woman who founded Sounds True, Tammy Simon. She interviewed Thich Nhat Hanh way back then. And she says to him, um, she says, I'm, I'm curious when you use the word God what you mean by it. She says, um, during your recent visit to America, you have uttered a very controversial statement that has shocked some of the members of the audience. And she said, you said it a couple times in public that God is a lesbian. <laughs> and this has sent some reactions through the audience, and I wanted to ask what you mean by that, and why you think that's an important thing to say. <clears throat> so this is what he says. He says, to me, God is the ground of our being. It is like the water. It's the substance of all the waves. If we are able to penetrate deep into our true nature, we <clears throat> suffer much less and we stop the suffering. There are a lot of wrong perceptions and discriminations that we, that we have created by ourselves and we make ourselves suffer and we make people around us suffer. And the key for liberation is to overcome these perceptions, these kinds of discriminations. And one of the best ways is to touch our own foundation of being. In Buddhism, we would call it nirvana. He says, these things are free from birth and death, free from all the ideas and discrimination. And when you get the kind of insight, a wisdom that is non-discriminative, you don't discriminate anymore and you are no longer afraid. And that is why if a rose touched herself deeply, a rose would touch her true being. God and a rose will find that God is a rose. If a rabbit is able to touch herself deeply, her ground of being deeply, and the rabbit will lose all her fear and her depression and all her complexes because she realizes that God is a rabbit. The blue sky, if she touches herself very deeply, she would know and say that God is the blue sky, the mountain also. If the mountains become itself and touches it deeply, the mountain realizes that God is a, ma is a mountain. So too for the African, the child, a woman, and a man. And it's in this context that I said God is a lesbian. I know he must be a lesbian in order for you to have a chance to liberate yourself, to, to get to the highest understanding, because you and him, you are one. So of course you could put God as a gay man. Right. 
God is a trans transgendered person. I just thought it was so beautiful and actually profoundly radical, um, and especially for the time. But I, I, I wanted to, to share it with you today partly because of the passing of, of Thich Nhat Hanh, because I just don't think, I think very few people uh, know that he said this. And so I want to keep it alive um, and honor him as my, one of my real deep teachers. And the other thing that, um, that he really um, shared was poetry. And he really believed um, in the power also of music. So always at his retreats there was lots of singing and his right-hand woman, Sister Chang Khan, would often in the afternoon we would lie down and she would just sing French lullabies to us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was lying down singing meditation. So I wanted to share this Thich Nhat Hanh song with you. We can sing it together put to music by my friend Betsy Rove, who, used, who traveled and sang with him a lot. So I'll sing one, li one line, and um, you can sing it back, and we can kind of ponder on this teaching that I just shared with you about our own essential being.
So um, <clears throat> on Thursday, it's the um, sometimes wonderful and sometimes perilous holiday oh, of oh. Valentine's, <laughs> 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 depending on many things. Um, and I, I once did a, a Dharma talk right around that time, and so I really did a sort of a deep exploration into Buddhism and love, um, which isn't always, I mean, it's talked about to some degree, but um, sometimes not that commonly, you know. And, um, and the deeper I got, the more I started to see that love, of course, permeates every aspect, every corner of Buddhism. And um, there's, uh, there's a, a, in Buddhism, as, as many of you know, things come in numbers, you know, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path. And there are things, there's something called the Four Immeasurables, the Brahma Viharas. And these are four kind of uh, qualities that are the, really the practice, the deep practices uh, that end up evoking love. And uh, the first one is loving kindness, which is, um, as many of you know, translated as metta, and has a lot to do with um, being able to kind of create feelings of desire for well-being for ourselves and for others. Um, and the second is compassion, which is karuna which is this felt response to the suffering of others, the sort of natural response that happens when we're not encumbered by our own neurosis. <laughs> and that there's this just, there's a teaching that, you know, humans are naturally bright, compassionate, wise beings. And it's such a beautiful, optimistic teaching. And I was raised in... Catholicism, and there was much that was beautiful about it, but one of the, you know, it was a, in the 1960s, there was a, still this sense of that something's kind of wrong with you that has to be redeemed or fixed or changed. No, it's not just in Catholicism. Many traditions have that strand. And that so the redemption is sort of the goal. But in this path, it's more about remembering who we are, waking up to who we are. And that's where the compassion arises from. Um, the third one is um, um, a upeka, which is joy. This capacity to feel um, just a kind of, grit, just this, this uprushing of uh, sweetness just at being alive and also being able to, this is sometimes harder, to feel mm -hmm. joy for other people's success. Yeah. I sometimes, look, if we look deeply, sometimes we can see that we that we get we get a temporary boost when other people fail. Right? What is that about? <laughs> it's so temporary. It's so you. It's so not helpful for anyone. But but it just it just comes from this feeling of inner deficiency. Somehow we feel it temporarily boosted up, but then it's like an endless wheel. So this capacity to just celebrate the joy of others, the successes of others, um, and then the last one, karuna. Uh, uh, the, it, uh, wait. See, I have to like. Ah, uh, mudita is joy. Sorry, and upeka is equanimity or peace, peace of mind. And one could study this forever for a lifetime, or the whole morning could be spent on this. But I just wanted to name these things because I thought well, I'm I want to do a mantra with these mm -hmm. words in them. And I thought it might be a way to experience Valentine's on Thursday. Uh, that maybe we could see it as a practice of the four immeasurables. I like that word, right? Because it means it's just there's no end to it. There's just endless amounts of it available, really. Um, I heard it described once in opposition to this poem by T.S. Eliot called Alfred Prufuck. Prufuck? And he says, um, I measure my life in thimblefuls. <laughs> and this is the opposite of that. This is oceans versus thimblefuls of a metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, loving kindness, compassion, um, joy, and equanimity. So on um, Thursday, I'm going to uh, sing this mantra when I wake up and, and have it be my mantra throughout the day and, and see if I can engage in each quality and have that be my Valentine's experience. Um, you don't have to like get rid of the chocolate and roses, but <laughs> it's just, so I invite you into this. It's just a 
very simple uh, singing of these words. So it's Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. Let's just say that. Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka. Again, Metta is loving kindness, Karuna, compassion, Mudita is joy, and uh, and uh, Upeka, which is uh, just deep peace or peace of mind, calm heart. Meta Karuna Mudita Upeka. You already know it? Okay. Meta Karuna Mudita Upeka. Meta Karuna Mudita Upeka. 
So some words from Thich Nhat Hanh that really invite us to expand our hearts, to create more space so that we can really embrace ourselves and others in a um, really a deeper way. And he has this beautiful metaphor. He says, if you pour a handful of salt into a cup of water, the water becomes undrinkable. But if you pour the salt into a river, people can continue to draw the water to cook, wash, and drink. The river is immense, and it has the capacity to receive, embrace, and transform. When our hearts are small, our understanding and compassion are limited, and we suffer. We can't accept others or tolerate others and their shortcomings, and we demand that they change. But when our hearts expand, <coughs> these same things don't make us suffer anymore. We accept others as they are, and then they have a chance to transform. Pema Children says, the only reason we don't open our hearts and mind, minds to other people is that they trigger confusion in us, that we don't feel brave enough or sane enough to deal with. <laughs> My friend Nina Wise says, when we come together like this in Sangha, in community, that we are creating a sane asylum. <laughs> 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 And in the times that we're living in, it just seems more and more that we need places of sanity to gather. I want to share this uh, beautiful mantra that I learned at Green Gulch Meditation Center on New Year's Eve a few years ago. They, they speak it, but I put it to music because I thought it would be so beautiful to sing. This is um, expanding this love to, to all beings. This is really a chant of the Bodhisattva, the one who... Um, is able to respond to the suffering of the world and makes a vow to return to this world until all beings are free from suffering. So the words are, eyes of compassion observing sentient beings. Eyes of compassion observing sentient beings. Assemble an ocean of blessings beyond measure. Assemble an ocean of blessings beyond measure. I like to um, expand the idea of sentient beings to water, and trees, and mountain, stones, however you want to hold that. Eyes of compassion observing sentient beings. Assemble an ocean of blessings beyond measure. Eyes of compassion, observing such a peace. Assemble an ocean of blessings beyond measure. Eyes of compassion, observing such a peace. Oh, 
cannot understand the suffering that life War and hate and hunger And a million other things When I've done all that I can And I've vowed to do Let sorrow be the doorway into an open heart and the light on the hills is full of mercy. The This silence, it will never desert me. I long to hold the whole world in these arms. We have maybe one moment, one minute. If anybody has anything they want to ask or share, a couple minutes. Thank you for sharing the joy. Thanks. It's everywhere. Thank you. It's uh, it's really wonderful to you know, to focus on 
the 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 way the body, like the way I feel in the body, like the the, the sounds resonating in my body yeah. instead of focusing on the pain when I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. It's a great alternative. <laughs> yeah. And you know, of course, chanting in song has been such, it's been, it, it didn't, in many of the Buddhist traditions that came to the West, it came intact. But in the Vipassana tradition, Theravada tradition, you don't get a lot of singing and chanting. But it's so much a part of this tradition, and it's so helpful to bring us into the body. It's, it's a beautiful way to move, move in and out of meditation. Come to Monday night, <coughs> come to Monday night in Berkeley. It's, more women and, uh, and men. And it's wonderful. wonderful. And, lo and lots of, uh, of men, uh, but lots of guys and, and, and a number who have come from this, this Sangha. And we, we sing half the time and we meditate half the time. We do about 40 minutes of chanting and 30 where, minutes where, where of sitting. It's uh, at Byron Street, on Byron Street at a place called Sacred Stream. Byron and Alston, not far from uh, San Pablo and University. It's very, very close. Mm -hmm. And you can find it on my website, Edge of Wonder, on my Facebook page. I just wanted to say I loved how you integrated the poetry with the music. Mm -hmm. That just really flowed beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I have to admit, a couple of years ago, the first time you walked in here with your thing, I thought, oh, whoa. <laughs> 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 and then you opened it up and you tuned us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. An ocean of blessings. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, Jennifer's website is um, edgeofwonder.com. Um, next week, Dave Rico will be a um, speaker, psychologist, teacher, and writer in Santa Barbara in San Francisco. Emphasis on Jungian, transpersonal, <coughs> spiritual perspective is in his work. He's the author of How to Be an Adult in Relationships. Um, so Donna sustains our sangha. Um, it uh, pays for the rent, our Provocant Street dinners, um, Don, our own Donna to speakers and teachers. Um, we suggest a donation of $10, but more or less according to your ability to pay. Um, do we have a host today? I'm Don. I'm your host today. There's hot water for tea. There will be some snacks. Um, put your cups in the sink when you're finished with them. Um, I think afterwards people go out for a meal if they so mm -hmm. care to. They gather at the front door yeah. at 1230. Great. <laughs> Um, and welcome our, uh, our first time guests. Thank you for coming. Okay, so can we, any other announcements? Yes. Just want to remind people, especially the new people, that on Saturday, March 23rd, we have the Spring Retreat, Wisdom Stories About Death and Afterlife with Cindy Spring. Uh, there's no charge requested that Don will help uh, defray or offer the speaker a, a reward, and um, there is a meal for each charge. Here. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it is here from 10 to 5 on Saturday. And it's getting close, so if you're interested, all the information is on the sheets that are outside on the presenter. Great. And you have CDs outside, correct? Yes. I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, one so can we gather for the dedication? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness which is without sorrow and may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Oh. 
Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.